Good evening, Internet Universe. I'm Peter Wilson, <laughs> music director of the Richmond Philharmonic, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to Cocktails with Conductors, our episode six, Some Like It Hot, Spirits of the Season. I'm joined, of course, by, by my co-host, Will Patty, the assistant conductor of the Richmond Philharmonic. Good evening, Will. Hey, Peter, how's it going? Thank you again. It's lovely to be here. Peter, uh, it looks like you are in a new location today. Where are you? I am in a new location. You may be seeing some sunlight coming through the windows over here. I am, it's I'm seven o'clock here. I'm in my new home <laughs> in San Francisco, ladies and gentlemen. But because I'm so connected to Richmond, I decided that it would be important for me to live in the Richmond district of San Francisco. Oh. <laughs> so here I am. That's the tie in here. I'm, I'm, I'm here in the outer Richmond district of San Francisco, very close to the Golden Golden Gate Park. It's just a beautiful view. I'm looking at the Pacific Ocean out here, the windows. Uh, but in any event, yes, it's uh, it's a little after four here, but we're going to talk as though it's the evening and yes. we're going to have and drink. As yeah, we're going to drink some hot cocktails. Yeah, it's not quite. How, how's the weather over there in Richmond? Virginia. Oh, it was a beautiful day here, except with the rain, uh, lots of rain, and now it's just really cold and wet <laughs> and wet in, in and Virginia. Wet. Nothing to write home about. You're cold and wet, nothing. so appropriate yes. for some hot cocktails. What do you think? Absolutely. And before we get started today, of course, I'd just like to take a, a little bit of time just to thank some of our amazing longtime supporters, the Virginia Museum of History and Culture for several years, the Virginia Department of Veterans Services for several years, Town Bank, thank you for 15 years of support. Thank you, Vogue Flowers, for over 30 years. And today, being uh, virtual Monday uh, for shopping, tomorrow is Giving Tuesday. And so we thought we'd just take a moment to plug Giving Tuesday for anyone who wants to donate to any of the organizations that they feel are important and impact their lives. Uh, if you'd like like to give to our organization, that would be a great way to do that. So Giving Tuesday is tomorrow, and hopefully you take advantage of that. That's all I have. Uh, Outstanding. <laughs> Outstanding. So, so we are in our sixth episode here. We've had a great run. This has been just super fun. Uh, we have one more episode to go in, uh, in this cycle. That's going to be in two weeks, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Very exciting program. Our last program, you, you cannot miss that program. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So up to now, we've been opening our shows with uh, various uh, standard cocktails, some perhaps not so standard, but, but they've all been standard in the sense that they've been generally cold drinks, I would say, cold sort of typical right. cocktails. And... Um, so we have a longtime listener out in Oregon, a uh, uh, John Kletzel, who uh, wrote in and said, you know, it is uh, the, the, the cold season coming up here with the holidays. You might want to talk about some hot cocktails. And when I went to you about it, Will, you and I both kind of had the same I, thinking, which was that, well, wait a minute, I, you know, I only know maybe one or two. I didn't realize there was, because I always think of like sort of... Um, hot toddies irish whiskey and you know kind of warming mm -hmm. that up with hot chocolate or something like that i didn't and then you even said that you just weren't you know all that into into that but then as you always do you went down the rabbit hole and holy cow you found just the the insane arsenal of hot cocktails so why don't you talk about that you you, you found a certain page and then yeah. i'll I'll, uh, and I'll i'll yeah. start with the first one here so yeah, the, the page that I always go to and the place I keep referencing is a, a website called Difford's Guide. And for anyone who's interested in finding more about cocktails, I'm just amazed at the detail they put into this website and their machine that they have that you can build cocktails. It's kind of like you look in your, your liquor cabinet or your bar and, and you may only have two things, but you can plug those two things into this website and they will list every cocktail that they could that they know that contains wow. those two ingredients that's and it's a really cool way to and that's kind of how i built my bar where it's like i had this one thing and then all i needed was to buy one other thing to make this really cool cocktail because that guide let me know about it so yeah lo and behold they had like 30 hot cocktails that were not your like standard mold wines and not your standard hot toddies were like really wild ones like the one that i'm that i made <laughs> 
<laughs> and I, I could talk about. It. Would you like me to do my cocktail first, or you want to do yours? It's whatever you think. I, I was thinking hey, of for a second because yours is yours is always is, very very out there and adventurous. So I was. And this one with, takes the cake. Go for okay. it. Okay. Well, okay. Then I'll go first because mine is a little more standard. It is in the toddy category, the hot toddy category, uh, and this particular cocktail is called the whiskey mac toddy. Okay. Now it's uh, a little bit of history here. It actually is based on uh, a standard cocktail called the whiskey mac. And I'll give a little bit of history on this. This is kind of fascinating. This cocktail's full name is the Whiskey McDonald. And it, uh, the, the, it's a, you know, it was a cocktail legend, basically. Um, this is a drink that was named after Major General Sir Hector Archibald McDonald, who lived from 1853 to 1903. And he was uh, then better known as the Fighting Mac. That was his nickname, Fighting Mac, due to his military exploits. This, of course, is so so perfect. I had no idea when I chose this cocktail that there would be a military connection. Of course, last episode, we got into all the Susan marches and general officers and things like that. So it's only fitting that I would somehow end up with the Whiskey Mac, the Whiskey McDonald toddy. Can you believe it? Peter, did you know that my grandfather, a lifelong uh, cavalryman for the army, his name is Mac as well. So he was oh a fighting Mac God. for a long well, time. There you go. Yeah. See? <laughs> so, so we got fighting Mac here, uh, who was a distinguished Victorian soldier and became something of a folk hero. Uh, so in any event, I uh, we got uh, want to give a big shout out to uh, our vice president, Jen Myers, who, of course, is the behind the scenes wizard. And I've asked her if she could put up um, the link to the origin behind the name of this particular cocktail, because it's it's actually pretty fascinating. As as with everything like this, uh, there there's a little bit of controversy. My my favorite my favorite line in this in this link though it says, "One should never let the truth stand in the way of a good story." So, that that can pretty much uh, sum up the the, the rest of the. Um, of the uh, the story here, but in any event, um, what we're dealing with is uh, a mixed mixing scotch, and uh, you know, uh, or you know, I've got some you know bourbon whiskey here that I'm going to be uh, dealing with. And the the key ingredient here, though, is the green ginger wine. And so uh, the particular uh, brand is uh, stones that they recommended. I don't know if you can even find another, another one here. It may or may not say the word green on it. This one does not. Uh, but, uh, it's, it's fantastic. And apparently, you know, back in the day, uh, during this kind of this period of time, they were mixing ginger wine with things because ginger of course was a healing agent. So if people were in battle and they were injured and things like that, you know, ginger was, uh, you know, kind of a wonder, a wonder ingredient to, to kind of help out with all of that. Okay, so the Whiskey Mac Toddy or the Whiskey McDonald Toddy, the Fighting Mac Toddy, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> We're going to make it here. So I've got my I've got my whiskey. I decided to bring in some Angel's Envy. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna we're gonna that use... made an appearance at our Thanksgiving festivities. The Angel's Envy did. Okay, all right then. So I'm going to put in here. Uh, I've got to go with um, one and a half ounces. So I'm gonna pop in here with one. Now, what's the name of yours? Oh, mine, uh, mine yeah, has a name. Yeah. It's a lovely name called Huckle My Buff. Huckle My Buff. Love it. Huckle My Buff, please. Uh, not a directive. <laughs> just uh, I'm not quite sure the exact origin uh, of the word, but uh, my cocktail does come from the 18th century and was re discovered so to speak so um, okay. as you're making yours i can start sort of introducing mine uh i i looked for the weirdest hot cocktail i could find and boy did i find one uh what do you have there peter i have some boiling water which okay wow. so you got the uh one and a half ounces of the whiskey 
And then we've got one ounce of the green ginger wine. Okay, and I've got that in this mixing cup here. And now I'm going to add three and a half ounces of boiling water, which I was able to figure out how to measure through this. Uh oh. That's okay. not good. That's not good. I just. Did you lose your glass? <laughs> I just broke the glass through. Oh, it shattered. No. Oh, dear. Okay. Oh, please. Well, I. Okay, well, hold. Go. <laughs> Oh no, that's not good. Live TV. So I'm so sorry. I hope everyone is safe over there, Peter. Oh no, <laughs> boiling water into your glass. Everybody is safe. Everything's fine. Nothing to see here. That's, nothing to see here. Uh, while Peter is getting himself cleaned up, I, I, I hope he's still safe. Yeah, I'm safe, but my computer is getting wet. Hold on. Okay, you save that computer, Peter. This is all good. <laughs> Please we'll save your computer. About this, I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that <laughs> yeah. Mighty Mac would be would be appropriately happy here. So sorry. It's all good. Great, thanks, Peter. Um, uh, and to learn, <laughs> while he's away, I will go hey, ahead. Will. And continue. Hey, Will, do we have yeah. any questions yet from our audience? <laughs> any questions coming in yet? Uh, we do have some, definitely have some questions about uh, some of the pops, uh, some actually some, looks like Dave has brought in a question about uh, something from the Carol um, in the bleak midwinter, um, but he was wondering if we could kind of go elaborate on that when we get a chance, but I'd still think, are you, are you going to start your cocktail over? Oh no, 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 we're good. Gotcha. I just know now Fantastic. that's the glass when I'm pouring, okay, that's hot, see, I'm not just, uh, this is, there we go, that's better. <laughs> how, did, how do they do this? This is just crazy. Well, bartenders are very tough people. You know, really. Yeah, yeah. we have a few more questions coming in for sure. So we'll, we'll definitely get to do. Okay. This is when we get a second. All it right. Looks good. And, Sounds and good. Now, and now I have the perfect glass. It's not a toddy glass, mm -hmm. I'm afraid, but it, it is a beautiful glass nonetheless, which I'm going to now pour my whiskey Mac. That's my whiskey Mac toddy, ladies and gentlemen. Delicious. Cheers. Cheers, Peter. Cheers. While it's hot. Um, so I, I will go ahead and give you a sneak preview. I have already manufactured. How is that, Peter? Yeah. That yes. Is. That is a fighting Mac. Are you going to give Beethoven a sip there too? I know, really. He's I think that should be a tradition. He's going to smell it. <laughs> He's going to smell it. Um, okay, to transition to the cocktail that I came across, I, of course, I'm looking for the weirdest hot cocktail, and I found one called Huckle My Buff. And it had five ingredients, and I liked what I saw as soon as I saw the first ingredient, which was a egg yolk and egg yolk and i'm not sure any of you have had cocktails before that use egg whites uh egg whites are used in cocktails a lot they, they froth up very nicely and add a very nice creamy texture to, to drinks um kind of like an egg malt but uh but this is just an egg yolk and okay. so when i first made this cocktail i was putting all the ingredients together and i and all of mine go into a blender it starts with one egg yolk and to that, you would add some cognac, which I added into the blender. Uh, I added a little bit of something similar to you. I have ginger liqueur. Oh. Uh, okay. Not a ginger wine, but it's but this is quite good, too. There are many fun cocktails you can make with this beverage. I'm really glad, you know, in building my bar, like finding things like this means it's a whole other bunch of cocktails I can sort of explore uh, just using this one ingredient. Adding this to gin and ice would just be really delicious. Um, like but meal. I added weeks ago so this is an 18th century cocktail uh for, called huckle my buff re uh discovered by a chef known as jamie oliver i think known as maybe the naked chef or the i can't not the barefoot chef he's one of those british chefs that apparently <laughs> that was a, that made a name for himself uh but he's he's pretty he's a kind of a celebrity chef he found this cocktail and he said this is not a dodo but a phoenix uh and he gave it a 20th I... century he gave it a 21st century treatment by adding some mixology and 
he used some of the ingredients that are standard to the old recipe, which is porter, uh, any kind of old British style beer okay. and gin. But uh, in this case, we're using cognac, uh, the ginger syrup and the egg yolk. And also I ended up making homemade uh, de demerara syrup, which is basically a brown sugar syrup. And I got to tell you, it's basically simple syrup, taking sugar and water, but it's a brown sugar syrup and it adds a very nice caramel flavor to whatever you're going to add. So I will use this in place of regular simple syrup and it was super easy to make. Wow. And uh, I saved the finishing part after I blended it in a blender. I'm going to save the finishing part, the nutmeg, uh, dusting of nutmeg for the very end here, which goes on top, fresh nutmeg on top. And here we go. Cheers. The oh, Huckle you're already set. Buff. Huckle already set. Heart. I already had it ready for you. Huckle Cheers, Peter. It's the Huckle whiskey man. Toddy. Oh, man. Is that good? Oh, man. I, I made it the first time yesterday, and I got to tell you, uh, I thought the egg yolk was a little gross. <laughs> <laughs> I okay used a very farm? farm, I used a farm fresh egg, like a very deep orange kind of egg yolk. And th today I decided to add a little more sweetness and I used only half of the yolk because it was quite, it was like drinking a warm oh. egg yolk. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I fixed it tonight and I have to say it is really nice. There's a nice little burn from the ginger you get. Um, okay. So okay. it really warms up. So it's really great. I'll also say that the other thing that attracted me to this cocktail was the original method of heating up the cocktail was to take a red hot poker and shove it into the glass. <laughs> so a little like what I just did with my drink and ended up shattering the glass. I shouldn't have used the poker. Oh well. Yeah, this was a this was a wild idea. But thanks for the idea of having hot cocktails. Um, it is a little bit cold this evening in Richmond, and so it's nice to have something warm for sure. So, absolutely. It gets a little it gets a little chilly at night here by the ocean at night. But uh, when the sun goes down, I may have to make another one of these and take it out take it out on a stroll on the beach. Well, that's great. So, and you've got some protein in your drink. Yes, I did. That's your dinner. <laughs> you got dinner right there. Yep. You're ready to go. You're ready to go. Yep. That's fantastic. Okay. Outstanding. So today is, uh, of course, the, the last day of November. I can't even believe it. Holy cow, right? 2020. We're <laughs> almost in the final month. And I was a little concerned about talking about holiday music, but then I realized that, you know, nowadays, uh, these radio stations just start kicking on holiday music pretty much the day after Halloween, and uh, and we we've we've all noticed that that malls tend to tend to start decorating back in September for Christmas, so <clears throat> and the other holidays. So uh, I think we're okay. I think we're we're okay not being actually in December to be talking about holidays um, and holiday music. But it's a it's a, important for us as conductors to discuss this if we're doing uh, what we certainly do each year in the Richmond Philharmonic, of course, not this year, but um, when we're dealing in programming for holiday pops concerts. Uh, and in Richmond, we, we actually have been uh, very fortunate to give not just one holiday pops concert, but we've, we've kind of evolved into three and in some cases, four holiday pops concerts, which is, uh, is somewhat rare uh, for an orchestra like ours. But um, but we've been able to find some really great and unique venues to play in. Uh, the, the Veterans Center uh, is, is uh, one, of, one of my favorites to, to, to get to perform in, uh, getting to give something back. Of course, now I'm a veteran myself, and so I, I look forward to getting back into the Veterans Hospital where we can uh, bring some holiday cheer as well. Um, but the do you, so uh, will when you've, uh, you in the orchestra that you conduct uh, talk about yeah. that do you, do you guys normally do a holiday concert? We do, yeah. We we were doing holiday pops last year, and uh, I you know some of the same pieces kept kind of you can see the same pieces between both orchestras. I think a good place to maybe start the pops conversation is is maybe just to discuss I think the elephant in the room, which is the one piece written by one of the most important holiday pops composers of all time. And I think that would have to be 
no discussion could could commence or happen without a discussion of Leroy Anderson. Ah, uh, yes, Leroy Anderson, one of the most uh, underrated composers, I think, uh, underrated American composers uh, in, our, in our in our history. And you know, and he didn't just write for. Um, I mean, it, it, you're right. Probably his most famous piece ever written uh, would be Sleigh Ride. Right. There, and no no holiday uh, concert is complete without Sleigh Ride, which I think is what you were getting at. Uh, the other the other famous piece that that uh, many conductors program uh, is the great uh, Christmas Festival, uh, right. which which uh, and both pieces have been arranged for band as well. So obviously, being a member of the Marine Band, we've we you know the Marine Band plays both right. of those every every season. The Marine Band always plays uh, um, the carols at Wolf Trap up in Northern Virginia, which is a, is a big tradition that's been great. Of course, again, just like every orchestra and every band, you know, things have been uh, put on hold this year uh, for, for COVID. But, um, uh, but Leroy Anderson had a really fantastic relationship with the Boston Pops and with Arthur Fiedler. Yeah. He did a lot of his composing. Uh, it, was, it was inspired by... Uh, by that relationship, and so, but there's so much other music that he wrote that was that was not. Uh, th those are really the, the two uh, holiday-driven pieces. But there, there are pieces like Fiddle Faddle and the Typewriter, uh, you know, Donkey Serenade. I mean, it just goes on and on. And actually, uh, Leonard Slatkin for I think it was, I think it was uh, Leroy Anderson's hundredth birthday celebration that. Um, that uh, Leonard Slatkin did a, a complete recording set. I want to say it's like three discs or something like that. There's like a box set that he did of all of Roy Anderson's music. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he was in the production of that back when I worked with him in 2008. Uh, he was working with uh, various orchestras to put that together. Um, and uh, and he, he would talk about how the genius of Leroy Anderson. Right. And it's funny, you know, we... Uh, the uh, people often pronounce his name Leroy Anderson for for many 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 years, uh, and I I was uh, I found out that that. And to be honest, uh, I did up until that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did <laughs> until about thirty minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, and I did as, and I did as well for years. I mean, it sounds right, Leroy Anderson. Why wouldn't you say Leroy Anderson? Uh, but but there are many Leroys that pronounce their name Leroy, um, uh, and. Uh, he, uh, but I, but I found out the correction. I was corrected by the baritone vocalist of the Marine Band, who was corrected himself on a tour where they were performing Leroy Anderson's music, and he was announcing him as Leroy, only to be corrected by none other than Leroy Anderson's widow, who was in attendance at that particular concert. It might have been even in Boston. I'm not sure, but yep. uh, if, if if that is in, as close to the source as we can get, I just don't know what else would be. Uh, so in any event, there it is, uh, Leroy Anderson. We, uh, you know, we had a, a, a fun, a fun time several years ago. I think it was 2012 when uh, Dave Letterman won the uh, Kennedy Center honor and he came to the White House mm -hmm. and he heard, he got, he got to hear Sleigh Ride there by the Marine Orchestra in, in the foyer. And I was downstairs with my colleague, Aaron Clay, who we've talked about before, who was, who was going to be our yeah. solo this past uh, spring. And uh, he and I were downstairs playing and, and Dave Letterman came up to us and he was asking about our red coats and things like that. And he actually went right up to the Marine Orchestra and asked them if they would play. He's a big fan of the military. He would go over overseas and, and visit in those USO uh, tours, uh, Dave Letterman did for many years. So he came right up to the Marine Orchestra in the foyer at the White House and asked the Marine Orchestra to play, of all things, the Marines hymn. And I have to tell you that, you know, we play that, the Marines hymn, obviously a lot in the orchestra and obviously in the band. I can't, had not remembered in my entire career of 30 years ever playing the Marines hymn in the White House. It just never came up. Never, there was never a reason to play it. They might, the band might play it out on the South Lawn as part of like an armed forces medley or something. But that's even, that was even fairly rare. Well, he asked for it, 
And luckily, that's one of those pieces that we just happen to have memorized because we play it so much. So the conductor just went right. Didn't No one pulled up the music. They just, boom, right into the Marine Tim, and he loved it. And I got a call. So that would have been on a Sunday. And on, I think it was uh, Tuesday, Tuesday or Wednesday morning, uh, I was driving in for a rehearsal the next, that, that next week. And, uh, and I got a call from our operations officer and he said, uh, Hey, uh, so we need to put together an orchestra to go up and play on the late show with Dave Letterman next week. And I thought he was kidding. I mean, there's just no way that's going to happen. He goes, no, 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 I'm totally serious. And it's, if we can't do it on this day, it's going to have to be the, the band, but if, cause we have white house receptions that we have to play, but if it's on any other day of the week, we could use the orchestra, which is exactly what Dave Letterman asked for. He wanted the orchestra because that's what he got to see in the White House. And so sure enough, we went up that next week and uh, it was on a Monday. So it was like less than a week that this whole thing was put together. And what was really funny is, you know, speaking of cold weather, we got up there yes. and you probably heard all the jokes about the Ed Sullivan Theater being cold. They are absolutely true. It was absolutely Didn't know that. freezing. It was like 40 degrees in there. And apparently it's because the lights get so hot and Dave doesn't want to sweat and the whole thing. But all the guys in Paul in Paul Schaefer's band, the NBC orchestra, were always wearing winter coats. They just they're just back you there know, all the time. Now that you mention it. <laughs> it's hilarious, right? Now that you mention it, I do have a memory of that. So, so we're in there and we're playing this and, and we had to drive up super early in the morning. It was like 6 a.m. and we get up in there and, and uh, you know, it's like a five-hour drive. And then we get up and then we did, and of course, the taping was going to be at like 6 p.m. And so we were given a whole, the afternoon off, but we had to do all the sound checking because they, this was not recorded. They like do it live. They're recording it as we're doing it. So the, the sound has to be perfect. And they nailed it. I mean, when I go back and listen, I've never heard the Marine Orchestra sound better. I mean, all the balances were perfect. We played Sleigh Ride seven times in a row. <laughs> just, just play it again, play it again. They got all the camera that angles. Is... You know, everything was going to be set. And then oh, when man. you saw it, all that fusing together was all edited. It wasn't edited. It was just perfect, right? Camera yeah. three, camera one, camera two, get the guy with the, you know, Dave called it, who's the guy oh. back there with the boards, you know, with the whip. <laughs> so we put, we put right. it seven times in a row, bam, and then we were done. And then we came back and he had us play it, of course, for the show. And then right after that, he had us play the Marine Tim, which is exactly what his experience had been on the, the state floor. So that was, that was a real thrill. That was, that was really fun. That's so here, here to Leroy Anderson and the great slayer absolutely. Uh, absolutely it's it, it started with me in high school playing that piece and just knowing that it wasn't going to be the christmas holiday season so i played it on trombone and even in, in high school i started to think about the simple simple beauty of that piece it is hard to write something simple and it's hard to write something that is uh, memorable and sticks in your ear and and I've been thinking about Leroy the past couple of weeks that we've been preparing for this. And I, and I, I think his relationship with Arthur Fiedler is worth mentioning because the Boston Pops, you know, if you think about an American Pops orchestra is basically like the flagship. And Arthur Fiedler is probably the, one of the crucial elements of the reason they've had success. And without Without Arthur Fiedler, I don't think there would be a Leroy Anderson because Arthur Fiedler, I think, picked him out as a young composer just looking for work. And I think from what I've heard, Fiedler had been given stacks of, of compositions by young composers. Just write me something pops, do something great. And the general criticism was that most of the pops arrangements coming into the Boston Pops were a little too juvenile. And just were rinky dinky and not interesting enough. And along comes this guy named Roy Anderson, who's writing something at a orchestrating at a high level, who understood the orchestra. It wasn't just a uh, writing jingles for radio or writing pop songs. He was he had written for orchestras. He had studied like the European traditions and incorporated all of that into writing fun music. And I think that's that's where we should deeply appreciate some of the work he did because it is right. the quality of the orchestration, the simplicity of it, but it's the right registers for every instrument. Everything is so fine tuned and it's across the board that Leroy Anderson does this. And it's right. hard for anyone else to, to meet that mark 
to combine all those elements together without the understanding of like the orchestration, how instruments will sound. And so I do, I do really appreciate all that effort that goes into that. So yeah, to, clearly to the, to the, the classical tradition of the orchestra, Leroy Anderson was that wonderful bridge between those two worlds of, yeah. of getting pops, what I'll, what I'll call truly accessible music mm -hmm. with, with great tunes and things like that. I mean, uh, George Gershwin would have been another one, although he didn't write uh, uh, orchestral music quite at the, um, uh, with the, uh, you know, he wasn't quite as prolific on the orchestral side uh, and and he was a he was the biggest critic of his of himself. Uh, in fact, Rhapsody in Blue, as we know, he wrote for two pianos really, and then it was Ferdy Graffet that actually did the orchestration uh, for Rhapsody in Blue. And then you know, of course, Gershwin studied with with um, Ravel and started to really understand yeah. orchestration and started to write things like the Cuban Overture and and uh, you know. Porgy and Bess and American in Paris and things like that. So there, there were some really great, what we would now consider pops, orchestral music like that. The only other uh, uh, um, uh, parallel we could make with the composer would be John Williams, you know, but he, but of right. course his medium was strictly uh, film for, for, for so long. Obviously he's written some, what we would call sort of serious uh, pieces like concerto. Mm -hmm. He's got a violin concerto and a, tuba concerto and and, and dealing with a different scale of orchestra yeah some other some yeah. other pieces for the sort of serious orchestra that were not connected to film i should say but but like leroy anderson john williams obviously fully understood uh the the that sort of european tradition as you say of orchestral writing i mean he's writing for a very large you know malarian style orchestra uh that not a lot of film composers were really you know, ha had really been doing in the 60s and 70s anymore because it was kind of turning toward more computer music. Uh, but he was kind of bringing back the Korngold tradition of this, like an opera without words, you know, that, that's, that's, you know, with, with themes uh, and, and melodies being connected to, to characters and things like that. But yeah, no, you're right. I mean, there's no question that the Boston Pops was the flagship and they, and they are the reason why we have pops orchestras or pops concerts in any orchestra outside of that. Because I mean, Boston really was the, the genesis of all of that, which is where we have this whole arsenal of music now of people like Cal, Cal Custer and, um, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, you know, and many others that have done a lot of this arranging uh, right. of, of of music, of course, at various levels, right? They have to do the sort of juvenile versions of these uh, for high school orchestras, and you know, and 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 below. But a lot of these, which we played in the White House Orchestra, which was really a theater size orchestra, we were able to play a lot of these arrangements over the years. And of course, we're constantly trying to find new pieces, right? Because we're playing right. for we're playing for three to six hours at the White House any given night, and you don't want to repeat things. If you, right. if you don't have to, but of course we'll play sleigh ride for even, you know, probably twice. In the <laughs> so, I mean, you're going to pull that out in American festival. Uh, I mean, Christmas festival, right. Such a beautiful, I mean, obviously these aren't tunes that Leroy Anderson wrote, but he so magically combines all of these and there's nothing quite like the very ending. And I know, you know, this as a trombone player when the jingle bells is going on in the finale and then all of a sudden, oh, come all ye faithful, gets cranked out by the trombones as we take it home. And I mean, I get chills just thinking about it. And, and, and literally, there was not a year that mm. went by in my 30 years at the White House that I didn't have just the hair on the back of my head stand up when that part I, just always The did. first time I got to conduct the Richmond Philharmonic was last winter for the pop season. And then I was able to do the whole the whole concert. And I have to say, looking back at the trombone section, and, and there's actually a question that has come in uh, tonight, which is, what is your, what is your most favorite, uh, from Patricia, uh, Patricia, Patricia Jump, what is your most favorite holiday pops piece to conduct, and why? And I would say that moment that you're talking about, when you get to cue a section that you are a member of, or know the part of intimately, uh, knowing what they're experiencing as you give the gesture, uh, in a way, it's such a, a wonderful handoff. And uh, it's nice when they sort of can maybe make that same connection with you. 
uh, but it's it's lovely to see the bells come up a little bit and to, yep. to give the, the gesture yep. there. Um, do you have anything similar for you? I, I'm trying to think of other pieces that I, I truly enjoy conducting from the pops, the holiday pops repertoire, but that is an excellent moment you popped up. Um, I think the Christmas festival is 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 clearly would be in that top five. There's no doubt. I think sleigh ride would be also and a lot of fun, of course, <laughs> because of the whip. The whip is so much fun to cue. Uh, it's got some weird places and. Um, um, you oh know, yeah, like, um, yeah. Mark Holt has mentioned. He actually has a question about that. He said, "What's the secret to the horse whinny and the sleigh ride winning. with the trumpet at the yeah the trumpet at the back?" Yes. They, they go, you know, well, it, 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 yeah, it's a half valve. Uh, you depress the valves only halfway, which which enables you to kind of slide between the registers in an unnatural way. Of course, it takes uh, every trumpet player starting in high school refines this technique <laughs> over yeah. the years, and everyone has. That. What I love is every trumpet player has a just a slightly different winning, and it's the personality of the player, and, and that's it's, it's just great. <laughs> yeah, and it, this would be akin to the um, the glissando in yeah. Rhapsody in Blue that the clarinet has to play. You know, there are clarinet players that are tremendous clarinet players, classical clarinet players that can't do that bending, do -de -do -de -do -de -do -de -do you know, and then there are other jazz ones that can do it well, And but it's something you have to practice. It's a skill like anything mm -hmm. else. So is the winning in, uh, in Leroy Anderson's sleigh ride. Absolutely. I would love to be there at the moment that Leroy was sitting there and he was about to finish this piece and he had written whip cracks. I wonder at what point the, the horse when he, because we have to imagine that he knew that a trumpet player could perform this technique. Sure. Maybe that was the first thing he thought about when writing the piece. Maybe yeah, it was the I, last thing. You know, the, well, <laughs> if you think about it, the sleigh ride in general, the whole thing is set up with the horse's pulling the sleigh. Yeah. I mean, he's got, right. he's got the, the whip locks, you That's, know, yep. he already has the hoofs doing their thing. And so, yeah, I, I would think that he probably had, I mean, he was a master of that yeah. sort of special effects sounds, right? I mean, we think of mm -hmm. so many other, like the cl the syncopated clock. I mean, there are all these other pieces that he wrote where he took, uh, you know, standard orchestral instruments and then turned them into real life you know, personifications, right? So, uh, I mean, I just, so cool. I love it. It's so great when composers do that. You know, another, I just made me think of, um, if we think of like classical composers that are connected to holiday music, right? Yeah. I always think it's important to keep a balance of, of the right. sort of modern pops kind of stuff. And of course, it's easy to yeah. take pieces now from film, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, what am I thinking of? Uh, well, there's like the Grinch and there's um, Home yeah. Alone and Polar the, Express. Uh, Polar Express, uh, yeah. Frozen. Now, uh, yeah. the Miracle on on Thirty Fourth Street is another big mm -hmm. one. Uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. I want to say the yeah. Tim Burton film, right? You know, that's some really interesting stuff in there. Um, but it's also it's it's important, I think, to also you know make this connection, especially if you're in a symphony orchestra, to the old old and the new, right? You know, because yeah. that balance really makes the the pop stuff. It's sort of like dessert, you know. If you can bring out sort of so, let's talk about this. Yeah. Like Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker, and there's so many Huge. movements in there. You're not going to play the whole suite, the several, you know, multiple, right. you know, parts to the suite. Uh, everybody likes to hear the Waltz of the Flowers and and the Russian dance Tripic and and you know dance of the Sugar of, Plum Fairies, Sugar Plum Fairies. But you can mix those things up and you can do different movements each year. For example, if you want to do that. But another uh, uh, composer that we've done is um, that that utilizes sounds to make uh, mm -hmm. to refer to natural things would be Vivaldi's Four Seasons. Uh, and yeah. so if we pull out winter and we use like that slow movement, which is so beautiful um, that, uh, of course, it's a beautiful violin solo, but then it's also yeah. all the pizzicato is supposed to be the the dripping from icicles. You so know? cool. So it's like, it's just, I mean, it's so great. ahead of its time that Vivaldi yeah. was been writing such programmatic music. I mean, we all, all know from spring that he was doing the birds and then there's the thunder and the lightning in, in the summer storm. Summer, like yeah. that. 
I mean, it's just a tremendous uh, uh, a mix of those. I actually was looking at a program from the Boston Pops, uh, just kind of doing some research. You can find their actual printed programs from like the 1960s and some other cool lineups of how they did their holiday concerts. And I think there was a re uh, an album release and I love the way that they did the the Nutcracker. They interspersed a single movement from the Nutcracker in between two or three more standard pop tunes. So throughout oh, no. the whole concert, you were gonna yeah. get, you know, maybe a sleigh ride and something else like a white Christmas and then Trey Peck. And then he would play a, a few others. Right. And I hadn't seen it actually well, sort of broken up, up that way before. I've only seen it lumped together. Another thing that- sweet. Yeah, another thing that we did up in, uh, DC with the um, American Festival Pops Orchestra that always does a great holiday program and I'm, I'm their concert master there. Uh, Tony Maiello is the conductor and one of the things that he did one year is he picked out like three of the movements uh, from the suite mm -hmm. and then right after he's got such an amazing brass section of guys that come from like the Air Force Airmen yeah. of so these guys are all big band players and he pulled yeah. out those Duke Ellington arrangements Oh, yes, of, I'm so glad the, you mentioned this. Of the, uh, of the corresponding uh, movements from Nutcracker, and we would do the original, and then right after we would do the Duke Ellington version, which uh, Wynton Marsalis did as well with um, the Boston's members of the Boston Symphony. He had them on both sides. He did this whole, it was an educational program he did for PBS yeah. on like four videos. And, he, he, and it's such a great way and a technique to introduce, you know, the, the orchestra and its its sections and things like that and what it's capable of and he had a basketball in his hand and he's like you know really unique way of doing it but i mean those those Duke yeah. Ellington arrangements are just stunning right um, amazing to hear them right after the tchaikovsky's original is really powerful and, and effective if if the listeners haven't had a chance to hear the duke ellington arrangements of the of the nutcracker suite it is i remember the first time hearing it it was the first time I, I maybe I got Duke Ellington or really understood him on another level that yeah. uh, it is a style and that those are just melodies that you can do like, anything da, with and they're da, playful. Da, 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 yeah, it's da, so da, cool. Da, yeah, da, da, and then the sax is. It's like, what is going on? It's so really. Crazy. Great bit. Oh yeah, that's a really cool piece. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I actually have been doing a little more research into if I reimagine a, a pops concert um, to try and incorporate as much African American culture as possible. And and I've 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 done a little more research and I found a piece that I think is really fascinating. Um, and it's by a composer um, who I'm not sure if you heard of her, uh, Margaret Wise Brown. And it's based name. off of a, I'm, I'm sorry, no, I'm thinking about a writer, sorry, Margaret Bonds, excuse me. Margaret oh, Bonds okay. is her name. And she is, uh, she was an African-American composer. She lived from 1913 to 1972, but she wrote a piece uh, called The Ballad of the Brown King, which was actually a, which was a libretto written by Langston Hughes, uh, which was wow. to uh, incorporate, uh, it was a cantata that focused on um, the African King Balthazar, and it was not a whole nativity uh, cantata. And I've listened to it. There are very few recordings. The University of San Antonio, uh, University of Texas, San Antonio has a YouTube recording. And um, it's absolutely beautiful. It's beautiful um, um, American music, but it's uh, a whole reimagining of the nativity scene. And uh, I really look forward to someday trying to get a chance to perform it. Oh, the, yeah, the, but great. it made me think of the fact that pop's music is for an orchestra is tough because there is so much great choral music. And so if you're just dealing with a symphonic pops group, um, you know, there's so many amazing uh, African-American spirituals as well, but this is all gospel vocal based. And so my right. dream is to find well, more that, and more that's instrumental. A other, that's a whole other element, which of course, speaking of the yeah. Boston pops, you know, every, some years they would have the, the chorus come in and then then your repertoire can change entirely. I mean, you could, you could be doing- right things from the handled messiah uh you know you could really get get and, and actually the Leroy anderson uh christmas festival has choral you know arrangements that you can do with it and i also love you know people love sing-alongs but i i always there's so much music that you want to get through in an hour and 10 minutes or so um 
that I like to combine the sing-along element with the Christmas festival because it's just a snippet and <laughs> people love that. It gets them just in the right mood to be able to do that. I oh, wanted the to choreography that. of turning around and cueing the audience is, is its own special thing. Oh, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, we had some requests for me to play. Oh, so I yes. brought my violin tonight, Will, if that's okay. I thought maybe I'd play that's a little okay. something. This was something that you and I got to collaborate on last year on our uh, Pops concert. And this was a, a Sammy Nestico arrangement of I'll Be Home for Christmas, which I dusted off and, and put on finale because this was a kind of a long lost arrangement that the Marine Band has been, the Marine Orchestra has been playing at the White House since Sammy Nestico, the famous Sammy Nestico who wrote for uh, who worked with Quincy Jones and wrote for Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole and and and, and many others, um, and he but he was a ranger for the Marine Band uh, during the time of Lyndon Johnson and 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 at the the, the tail end of uh, President Kennedy as well, uh, and he left all of these arrangements in the Marine Orchestra Library and he did a whole bunch of these for str just string orchestra and that was it, and the the story goes you know when. We did a whole tribute concert to Sammy Nestico. It was band and orchestra. And he came out and in the lobby, I got to put together a string quintet to play all of these arrangements, long lost arrangements of his. And we couldn't do them all, but I picked all the best ones that I could find. And Sammy sat in the audience, it, you know, there in the lobby and we played. And the one thing that we love about these arrangements is, I mean, they're just gems, absolute gems. But the thing that confuses us about these is they're all so short. They're like a minute, minute and a half in most cases. And finally, he came up afterwards and he said, he, with a tear in his eye, he's like, I haven't heard these in 50 years. You know, he had, it, it hadn't been since 1964, 65, when he'd written these for the orchestra to play at the White House for Lyndon Johnson. And I asked him, and he was conducting the, the, the strings back then for these, for these balls, these state dinners. And I said, Sammy, I got to tell you, we love these arrangements. We play them to this day. But I have to ask you, why are they so short? And he said, oh, I'll tell you exactly why. Because because President Johnson came up to me, pulls me aside, and he says, Sammy, I need you to write me a lot of songs that I can dance to. But they're going to need to be real short because i got to be able to dance with as many ladies as possible during the night. I mean, incredible, Amazing. right? So, so, <laughs> what is you know, heart? It's, you know, you got to move to the next lady, but it would be rude to do it in the middle of the song. So, it's, But if the song ends, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, i got to go over here. You know, So it's great, right? Well, this is one of the wow. gems that came out of that was I'll be home for Christmas. And so I thought I'd play just this, uh, the, the, the melodic line here, which he had written a violin solo in it to pop out from the rest of the string orchestra. And what I want the listeners to listen for is, is Sammy's uh, beautiful blending of, of throwing in the, uh, the carol Deck the Halls in as he's doing transitions. Now, of course, we're gonna miss all of those lush chords and things like that oh, that we conduct last year, but- we'll, Dripping with harmony. Yeah, you can just, you can imagine them from, 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 from last year. Here's I'll Be Home for Christmas. Put everyone in their spirit.
Bravo, Peter. And of course, that ends with the bases. The whole, we had the whole bass section. Absolutely, so that was really special. That was lovely, man. I was I was just entering the Christmas spirit as you were playing that. And oh, there, is, there you go, perfect. Here's it is November. <laughs> Here's to Sammy <laughs> and to Roy. And oh, absolutely! Great Christmas Christmas composers and arrangers out there. Mm. Should we uh, maybe give a little sneak peek about next I'm next? Just about to say that. Let's talk about oh, our man. final episode for this cycle, episode seven, which I don't think we have a title for just yet. We'll have to come up with that. But uh, go ahead, Will. Tell us. Tell everyone right, so... about our, our our special guest and what we're going so to. So the doing. the. When we first discovered that we could do cocktails with conductors, a lot of ideas came out there. And in the early stages of meeting, uh, a suggestion was made that, hey, wouldn't it be cool if at some point during this cocktails with conductors thing, you guys got someone to make a signature cocktail? And, and immediately my brain started turning because I, um, I, it was Ken. Ken made that suggestion. Right. Thank you, Ken. Let's give Ken the credit for this brilliant right. idea. Because Ken, I have, I have been at work uh, for a long time trying to figure out, because I used to work in the restaurant industry in Richmond uh, for, since when I came back from Egypt. I did that for a year and met a lot of people, met a lot of bartenders who over the past decade have changed the Richmond landscape with bartending. And we are so lucky to announce that we have a very special guest lined up who works in Richmond. And should I give her name or should we wait? Yes, or... absolutely. Oh, absolutely. So if you are uh, uh, um, a fan of the restaurant Saison or uh, go to the restaurant Long Oven, which is one of America's top rated restaurants here in Richmond, the head bartender is a woman named Sophia Kim. And Sophia Kim and I go way back. She has has been a recipient of the Woodford Reserve Manhattan uh, Award for the past three years for making the best Manhattan in the region of the Midwest of the Mid-Atlantic. Wow. Uh, she my is favorite a drink and my favorite known bourbon. Oh, I need to have her make she those. She is no joke. And she's been making cocktails for Saison for a number of years. She's now the head bartender at Long Oven. She is super excited to be working about it. I working with us. I told her about the project. She is super on board. She's a former pianist and so the conversation immediately began in a great place where she started to talk about the creation of a cocktail that is that mimics the way an orchestra is also made up and uh, peter and i have had a chance to work with her and she, you are going to be super in for a real treat because she will be our next guest uh in two weeks time where she will unveil a signature cocktail that she has made to represent the richmond philharmonic and I believe we're going to tie in some Beethoven element in there as well. She so is the thing. The yeah. Right. So, yeah. Th so, Will, thank you first of all for introducing me and and the orchestra to to uh, Sophia. She is she is truly an artist. I mean, we can honestly say that she is a, clearly an amazing mixologist and bartender, and she has an artistry that's that's parallel to those of us that are in the music business, right? So, this is like the perfect pairing, I think. We've got this cocktails with conductors idea, and we thought it would be the perfect way to close uh, the year uh, uh, and, and, and this cycle. But we talked about how, you know, this, this episode is going to air on, on December 14th. She's going to come on, and that's two days before Beethoven's 250th birthday, my buddy right here. And so we're going to celebrate, and she's going to try to tie this all in. We had a wonderful conversation with her, and she's She's talking about the parallels between creating a cocktail and all of the, the, the tastes and, you know, bitters and, and the, the, the mixing of, of the bass alcohol and how this relates to an orchestra where you have the strings and the woodwinds and the brass and the percussion and all of these different elements that can come together that, that all have different sounds and in her case, the different tastes but they all have this sort of ratatouille element where when you bring it together, it makes the perfect cocktail or the perfect symphonic piece. So uh, we can't wait to have her on again. Thanks so much, uh, Will. Thank you all for tuning in to episode six here. And we hope you have a wonderful holiday season. Uh, you've got a couple of hot, hot cocktails that you can make. One very simple and one very involved with a lot of protein <laughs> in it. And, uh, and so... <laughs> 
We're uh, but we're we can't wait to to bring on Sophia Kim and join you yes. all in two weeks. Please join us for that. That'll be very cool. All right. Good night, Will. Yes. See ya. Thank you.